Welcome to this webinar on the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years, an integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. My name is Mark Tremblay. I'm the Director of Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and I'm the Chair of the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology Guidelines Committee. Through this presentation, I'll briefly cover the background and rationale for these guidelines, the methods we used, the final guidelines that are a result of our work. I'll provide a little bit of information on surveillance and monitoring, the dissemination, implementation, and activation plans, and evaluation and future research that needs to be done. So as some brief background and rationale, most people would be familiar with the fact that the early years is a critical period for physical, mental, emotional, and social development. So it's, a, it's essential that we set our young kids off on a healthy trajectory. And we know that nearly all Canadian toddlers, uh, that is kids aged one to two years, and about three quarters of Canadian preschoolers accumulate 180 minutes of physical activity at any intensity per day. In other words, they meet the existing Canadian physical activity guidelines for kids of that age. However, only 15% of toddlers and 18 to 24% of preschoolers meet the screen time recommendations. And there are currently no systematic review informed sleep guidelines for children of the early years. Now, if we think of health as it relates to the various movement behaviors, we've got physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And we know there's a relationship, for example, between physical activity and sleep, a bi-directional relationship such that if we're more active, we tend to have better sleep. If we have good sleep, we're more likely to be active the next day. And similar relationships exist among each of the various movement behaviors, and they all relate to our health. So to give an example of this, we know that if we're physically active, it's good for us. It's related to a number of health, positive health indicators. However, we also know that if we're physically active, yet also get an extended amount of sitting or excessive screen time, that the benefit of the physical activity to our health is attenuated. So there's a smaller benefit there. And similar relationships exist among the various movement behaviors in the diagram. So it's becoming apparent that there's very close relationships among the various components on the movement continuum, all the way from sleep at the lightest end to very energetic play in the context of the early years at the opposite end. There's interaction among these things, they influence one another. And it's quite clear from the evidence that the whole day matters. And our previous isolationist approach to examining things and providing guidelines, uh, where we would come out with guidelines simply on, on physical activity or just on screen time or just on sleep, is, is a misrepresentation of the importance of the integrated nature of the movement behaviors. So we set out to develop 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years following the framework that was published in Physical Activity and Health textbook. The citation is provided there for you. And further details on the, the process used have been recently published in BMC Public Health at the citation provided on the screen. So I'm going to walk you through the process that we followed um, to complete these guidelines. And this began in November 2015, as you can see in the, uh, in the flow chart here that, that um, is going to be with us through the next several slides. I led this process with close cooperation by Valerie Carson at the University of Alberta and, and several other key people that formed the leadership committee. That included the principal investigators, the funders, the lead researchers on the systematic reviews, and methodology consultants. The partners um, that were a part of the leadership committee and provided funding for the study included the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology, who owns the guidelines, the Healthy Active Living <coughs> and Obesity Research Group at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Faculty of Physical Education and Recreation at the University of Alberta, Participation 
and the Public Health Agency of Canada. So moving along the guideline uh, development process, so after the leadership team was established, we engaged right away methodologists that would help to not only advise us on what we were doing to be sure we were following best practices, but also assess the process as we went along. Then we established a guideline development panel, a comprehensive group of people that included the leadership committee, research experts, stakeholder groups, knowledge users, international collaborators, methodology consultants, target population users, including parents, and project managers. The methodological consultants were key to the quality of the work that we did. They guided us through and, and assessed us as we went using the Appraisal of Guidelines for Research Evaluation 2 instrument provided here on the screen, which we have used in the past in the development of Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines, for an example. And they also advised us and guided us uh, on the use and the application of the Grading of Recommendations Assessment Development and Evaluation uh, process, the grade process which was used to evaluate the quality of the evidence to inform the guidelines. Next, now in February of, uh, of 2016, we hosted the first guideline development panel meeting. This was held in Ottawa in February of 2016. The objectives of that meeting were to outline the guideline development process, responsibilities and timelines, introduce the methodolo methodology consultants and explain their responsibilities to the guideline panel, hear from international delegates uh, to try and facilitate potential harmonization and efficiencies of our work, to finalize the process of evidence gathering and determine the PICOs, which I'll explain in more detail later, of the systematic reviews, to establish the timelines for the project, and plan for knowledge translation, dissemination, and evaluation. So there were several sources of evidence that fed into the development of these guidelines, including four systematic reviews, one on physical activity behaviors and health, one on sedentary behaviors and health, one on sleep behaviors and health, and one on movement behavior combinations, any combinations of the three above and health outcomes uh, or health indicators in the early years. We also completed a compositional analysis of the Canadian Health Measures Survey that will be explained further on. So the systematic reviews were comprehensive and included several health indicators as listed on this slide. They didn't all include the same indicators, but these following indicators were, were uh, included in the systematic reviews, including indicators of adiposity, motor development, cardiometabolic health, fitness, growth, bone and skeletal health, psychosocial health and emotional regulation, cognitive development, sedentary behavior and physical activity, which were included in the sleep review only because, of course, they were the focus of the other ones, and any risks, that is, injuries or harms that might have arisen from the intervention in the uh, respective papers. The systematic reviews followed the following general process. The population of interest were apparently healthy infants, that is children one month to less than one year, toddlers one to two years, and preschoolers three to four years. Online databases were searched for relevant articles meeting the inclusion criteria. No study design limits were applied. English and French articles were eligible for inclusion. The grade framework was used to guide the evaluation of the quality of the evidence by health indicator and by study design where possible. Overall, among all four of the systematic reviews, nearly 35,000 articles were screened, 271 papers were included in the final reviews, one meta-analysis was performed, but generally narrative syntheses were conducted in all reviews because of tremendous heterogeneity of the study designs, measures, outcomes. So to go through the systematic reviews one at a time briefly, the one that looked at physical activity and health included 96 studies, 
with over 71,000 participants from 36 countries. The grade quality of evidence ranged from very low to high. Key findings included evidence that specific types of physical activity, total physical activity, and physical activity of at least moderate to vigorous intensity were generally favorably associated with multiple health indicators, with evidence that more tends to be better. We also found evidence for infants that 30 minutes of tummy time per day while awake appears beneficial for motor development. Extensive details of this systematic review were just published in the special issue of BMC Public Health associated with the development of these guidelines as provided in the citation on the slide. The sedentary behavior systematic review also had 96 studies with over 195,000 participants from 33 countries. The quality of the evidence ranged from very low to moderate. Key findings included evidence that objectively measured total sedentary time was unrelated to adiposity and motor development. Time in front of screens was associated with unfavorable adiposity, motor and cognitive development, and psychosocial health. Time in car seats or strollers and in the supine position were associated with unfavorable adiposity and motor development or was unrelated to those indicators. Reading and storytelling was generally associated with better cognitive development, uh, though and in some studies showed no relationship. Again, extensive details and all of the uh, reviews of all of the studies are provided in a recently published paper uh, in the same BMC public health issue. Uh, that was released associated with the guidelines as provided with the citation on the slide. The sleep systematic review included 69 studies with nearly 150,000 participants from 23 countries. Quality of evidence ranged from very low to high and the key findings included shorter sleep duration being associated with higher adiposity, poorer emotional regulation, impaired growth, more screen time, and higher risk of injuries. There was an unclear association with cognitive development, motor development, physical activity, quality of life, and well-being. And as with the other systematic reviews, detailed information is available in the special supplement of BMC Public Health um, on this systematic review. The systematic review on the combinations of behaviors included only 10 studies with approximately 7,500 participants from five countries. The quality of evidence ranged from very low to moderate. And key findings demonstrated that ideal combinations of physical activity and sedentary behavior, so in other words, higher levels of physical activity, lower levels of sedentary behavior, were associated with favorable motor development and fitness in preschoolers, favorable adiposity, or in some cases unrelated to adiposity in toddlers and preschoolers, and that th there was no relationship with growth in, in these studies. Ideal combinations of sleep duration and sedentary behavior were associated with lower adiposities in infants and toddlers. And once again, detailed information on this systematic review is available in the citation on the slide. We also completed compositional analyses um, on the Canadian Health Measures Survey. Now just to put some context to this, movement behaviors have traditionally been uh, assessed in isolation. So we would look at very energetic play or in the context of older people, physical activity or sleep, but in isolation. But because the constituent parts explain the full 24-hour period, any change in one behavior must be done at the expense of another. So if we tell people to increase their physical activity by 15 minutes, that has to be done at the expense of 15 minutes of something else, perhaps light activity, perhaps sedentary behavior, perhaps sleep. And clearly, even from that example, taking time from sleep, for example, to be more physically active is probably not as good for us as taking time from sedentary behavior to be physically active. Traditional statistical procedures can't address this geometric reality and may produce incorrect results. So, so this confined space of the 24-hour period needs to be dealt with analytically in a particular way. 
And the recommended procedure for that, uh, the correct geometric way to deal with that, is through compositional analyses. And they represent a relative proportion to uh, uh, a proportion relative to the other behaviors instead of the assumption of independence from the other behaviors. So they recognize the, the fact that you need, when you add one, you need to take away from another. So the objectives of this analysis was to explore the, com the combined associations of the composition of sleep duration, sedentary time, light physical activity, and moderate to vigorous physical activity with adiposity as measured by BMI z-score or waist circumference. And to explore the associations between each behavior individually and adiposity relative to time spent on the other behaviors. I'll explain a little bit more in the results. We used cross-sectional data from 552 children aged 3 to 4 years from cycles 2 and 3 so those were measures between 2009 and 2013 of the Canadian Health Measures Survey. This slide demonstrates the proportional distribution of the 24 hours amongst these behaviors on the right-hand part of the slide. So you can see that kids of this age spend a, nearly half of the day sleeping, nearly a third of the day in sedentary behavior, 16% in light play, and 4.5% in energetic play, or what we would consider to be moderate or vigorous physical activity in, in other age groups. The analyses showed that the composition of the movement behaviors was significantly associated with BMI z-scores, but not to waist circumference. So the composition is the individual combinations of these four behaviors of kids, and those were, that combination was significantly associated with the BMI z-scores. Time in each of the sleep, sedentary behavior, light play, or energetic play was not significantly related to adiposity indicators uh, relative to the other behaviors. So in other words, it's the combination that had the relationship with the health outcome, not the individual ones relative to the other behaviors. So it substantiates the importance of the whole day and all these combinations of behaviors in relation to at least uh, the adiposity outcome in this study. Details of this study are also available in the supplemental issue uh, in BMC Public Health as indicated by the citation on the slide. There are several considerations that need to be taken into account in uh, developing guidelines uh, and assessing the evidence using the GRADE framework. We need to decide on the direction and the strength of the guideline recommendations. So the direction being for or against and strength being strong or weak. And these judgment calls are informed by a number of things including the quality of the evidence as described in the, the systematic reviews and, and the compositional analyses in the previous slides. And this includes assessments of risk of bias inconsistency of the evidence, indirectness of the evidence, imprecision of the evidence, and publication bias. We also need to consider the balance of benefits and harms assessed through the systematic reviews and the guideline development panel deliberations. So will the recommendation, will the benefits of the recommendation outweigh the harms? And that needs to be considered. We need to assess end user preferences and values the feasibility of the recommendation, the acceptability, and the equity of the recommendation. And these were assessed through a stakeholder survey, focus group meetings, and key informant interviews, and I'll describe these in a minute. And we also need to consider the resource implications or the costs um, associated with the recommendations. And those were also assessed through stakeholder survey, focus group meetings, key informant interviews, and a review of the literature. So continuing on with the uh, guideline development process, the next thing that happened after all these systematic reviews and analyses were done is we hosted the second meeting of the guideline development panel in January of 2017. The objectives of this meeting were to review, discuss, debate, and interpret the findings from the systematic reviews and compositional analyses, to review results of the cost-effectiveness resource use analysis, 
to craft individual components of the movement behavior guidelines and then synthesize those together to create 24-hour integrated movement behavior guidelines. We wanted to identify research gaps and plan the launch, dissemination, promotion, and evaluation activities that needed to come afterwards. So in the period from February to April of 2017, we hosted the stakeholder consultations, which included three elements, an online stakeholder survey, a series of focus groups, and key informant interviews. Details of, these, of this background work is available in another paper in the supplemental issue of BMC Public Health as indicated by the citation on the slide. So some details on the stakeholder survey. It was a cross-sectional survey done in English and in French uh, and it was developed to gather stakeholder and end-user feedback on the content and format of the guidelines, the elements of importance to the great evidence to decision framework that I discussed a couple slides ago, for example, how much end-users value the outcomes, the resource requirements or costs of implementing these recommendations, the guidelines, equity issues related to them, acceptability, and feasibility of implementing the guidelines. We also asked for suggestions regarding key intermediaries to, uh, to implement and activate the guidelines. So through whom should these guidelines be promoted? The survey was shared via a snowball sampling procedure initiated through the Guideline Development Panel distribution networks and was live from March 24th to April 18th, 2017. In addition to the stakeholder survey, Focus groups and key informant interviews were completed to examine stakeholders' and end users' perceptions of the draft guidelines. Stakeholders included experts in pediatric and family medicine, experts in physical activity knowledge translation and research, and the end users were parents, early childhood educators as examples. Stakeholders, with a sample size of 10, engaged in telephone interviews and end users 92 people uh, participated in the focus groups, 14 focus groups. And they discussed the perceived clarity and need for the guidelines, put potential barriers to implementation, identification of credible messengers for the guidelines, and methods for dissemination. Audio recordings from the focus groups and interviews were transcribed verbatim and thematic analysis was conducted. The guideline revisions and agree assessments uh, were the next stage in the guideline development process done in April of 2017. So a subcommittee of the guideline development panel reviewed the summaries from the stakeholder survey, the focus group meetings, uh, and the key informant interview results, and revised the guidelines based on this feedback. The revised guidelines were circulated to the entire guideline development panel for comment and final revision. Consensus was achieved on the final guidelines among the guideline development panel. Revisions were then translated to finalize the French version. And four independent reviewers conducted the agreed to assessments on the entire guideline development process described in the previous slides. Additional details, if you're interested on the agree assessments and more details on the guideline development process is available on the CSEP website at the link on the slide. So a brief description of the deliberation, consultation and assessment findings. We had more than 50 leadership committee meetings in the development of these guidelines. There were two guideline development panel meetings consisting of almost six days of face-to-face -face meetings and consensus was achieved on the final guidelines. The online survey included input from 695 stakeholders and end users from throughout Canada and around the world, including the physical activity and fitness, public health, healthcare, education, and research sectors. Agreement with the content and the format of the draft guidelines was very high, greater than 90% and often greater than 95%. High agreement that the guidelines are feasible, acceptable, useful, cost-effective and equitable across the populations was evident from the stakeholder survey. 
There was a strong endorsement from the focus groups and the key informant interviews, very much in alignment with the stakeholder survey. A strong recommendation for all guideline statements uh, was agreed to by the guideline development panel. And the four independent agreed to assessors rated the guideline development process as very high, with domain averages ranging from 89 to 100 percent. So we had a substantial amount of evidence to inform the final guidelines. We had the four systematic reviews, the compositional analyses, the expert consensus, the stakeholder feedback, and the methodological advice from our consultants. And this created the foundation of evidence upon which the guidelines are based. So next in the guideline development process is the knowledge translation and guideline launch planning. And so this occurred in the period between April and November. The knowledge translation included the development of a visual identity for the guidelines public-facing tools and resources, like tear sheets, for example, implementation and activation plans that I'll discuss in a little more detail soon, and finally, the, the planning for the launch, which occurred on November 20th of 2017. Now, in terms of the visual identity, some of you might be familiar, familiar with the uh, iconography that just came up on the screen there, and this is from the Children and Youth 24-Hour Guidelines and the four speeds of childhood demonstrated in this stylized number four, sweat, step, sleep, and sit, calling people's attention to the fact that the whole day matters, that a healthy day includes the right combination of sweating, stepping, sleeping, and sitting. So in other words, a combination of moderate to vigorous physical activity, light physical activity, sleep, and minimizing screen time. And that was the, those were the guidelines for children and youth, so school-aged children and youth aged 5 to 17. So building off that iconography and trying to develop a family in a recognizable pattern of visual identity, this is the symbol for the early years guidelines. So you'll see some differences. Uh, the sleep and sit are essentially the same. But but the category of sweat and step in the context of the early years has been combined into one category of move. Early years children generally don't exercise to sweat and some of them are not even able to walk uh, at younger ages and so, so we just changed the terminology there but uh, kept the consistent visual identity. So hopefully you'll become familiar with these as we deal with other age groups in the future as well. So here are the final guidelines, and I'm not going to read through this, but the guidelines on tear sheets and uh, in, in presentations to practitioners and so on will include uh, a double-sided page, which includes what is up on the, on the slide now, the preamble and background for the guidelines. So the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years, an integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And this preamble gives some background information to whom do these guidelines apply? Why are they important? What are the benefits of following them? How were they developed? Where can I find out more information? And on the other side of a tear sheet will be the guidelines themselves, as you can see here. And you see the iconography, the visual identity pop up there, the move, sleep, and sit. Early years children need to move, sleep, and sit in the right combinations for healthy development. And because this age category of zero to four, although not many years, it does include several important uh, stages of development for kids. And so they're split, of course, into infants less than one year, toddlers one to two years, and preschoolers three to four years. And the specific guidelines are there, and I'll go through them in the subsequent slides. So the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years recommend for healthy growth and development, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers should achieve the recommended balance of physical activity, high quality sedentary behavior, and sufficient sleep. A healthy 24 hour includes, for infants, being physically active several times in a variety of ways, particularly through interactive floor-based play, and of course, more is better. For those not yet mobile, this includes at least 30 minutes of tummy time spread throughout the day while awake. Sleep should include 14 to 17 hours for those aged 0 to 3 months, 
or 12 to 16 hours for those aged 4 to 11 months. This should include good quality sleep and includes naps. On the sitting guideline, not being restrained for more than one hour at a time, for example in a stroller or high chair. Screen time is not recommended in this age group. And when sedentary, which is important at this age group, engaging in pursuits such as reading and storytelling with a caregiver is recommended. Replacing time restrained or screen time with additional energetic play and trading indoor for outdoor time while preserving sufficient sleep can also provide greater health benefits. For toddlers, a healthy 24 hours includes at least 180 minutes of time spent in a variety of physical activities at any intensity, but including some energetic play spread throughout the day, and again, more is better. Sleep should include 11 to 14 hours of good quality sleep, including naps with consistent bedtimes and wake times. And not being restrained for more than one hour at a time, for example, in a stroller or high chair, or sitting for extended periods. For those younger than two years, sedentary screen time is not recommended. For those aged two years, sedentary screen time should be no more than one hour and less is better. When sedentary, engaging in pursuits such as reading or storytelling with a caregiver is encouraged. And again, replacing time restrained or sedentary screen time with additional energetic play and training indoor for outdoor time while preserving sufficient sleep can provide greater health benefits. For preschoolers, a healthy 24 hours includes at least 180 minutes spent in a variety of physical activities spread throughout the day, of which at least 60 minutes is energetic play and more is better. 10 to 13 hours of good quality sleep, which may include a nap, with consistent, in bed and with consistent bedtimes and wake up times is recommended. It is also recommended not to be restrained for more than one hour at a time or sitting for extended periods. Sedentary screen time should be no more than one hour and less is better. When sedentary, engaging in pursuits such as reading and storytelling with a caregiver is encouraged. And similar to the other age categories, replacing time restrained or sedentary screen time with additional energetic play and trading indoor for outdoor time while preserving sufficient sleep can provide greater health benefits. Now to some of the dissemination, implementation and activation activities now that the guidelines are released. Well first we had proactive national media relations outreach for the release of the guidelines and we, we received very good media coverage and, and media impressions so hopefully you listening to this uh, presentation have heard of it or seen it in the news. We have extensive hard copy and e-distribution of the guidelines and related materials. You can go to the CSEP website to, uh, to get copies in English and in French or you can order them through the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. We have planned um, a cross Canada lecture tour related to the guidelines. Webinars like this uh, have been targeted to different end user groups um, and this particular presentation is preserved online at the website on the screen in both English and in French. All promotional materials, campaigns, and initiatives are available in both languages. A suite of prepared messaging and communication tools, the adapted visual identity that I explained earlier, and a digital platform designed to serve as a foundation for long-term, multi-platform, multi-sector, multi-jurisdictional, and multidisciplinary marketing and communications efforts to facilitate the uptake and activation of the new guidelines is under development. Uh, so stay tuned for that. You'll be able to find out more about that on the CSEP website and the participation website. Some of you will be familiar with Build Your Best Day, uh, which was developed for the 24-hour guidelines for children and youth. Um, and we're trying to build off that. We're trying to extend that for the early years to enable clear, consistent, and targeted communications with early childhood educators primary care practitioners and public health promoters and parents and caregivers. That also is under development and stay tuned uh, for that and watch for the Build Your Best Day website for additional information on that development. We have some evaluation activities planned. 
We have collected uh, metrics related to the guidelines launch that included traditional media impressions and the social media activity associated with the release. We are collecting information on hard copy and electronic distribution of the guidelines. And we're assessing the general tone of the media coverage that was related to the guidelines release. And it was generally very positive and on target. Canadian parents' baseline awareness of the guidelines immediately after the launch uh, has been collected via a participation survey. And that will provide baseline information should we have the opportunity to collect follow-up information in the future. Beliefs among key stakeholders, that includes primary care providers, public health promoters, and early childhood educators about the relative benefits of the 24-hour guidelines being integrated versus separate guidelines for each behavior, or it's also being assessed via an online survey. And web analytics will be monitored on partners' websites to see uh, the, about the uptake and utilization of the various materials we've developed for the guidelines. There's much future research that's required in this area to inform these guidelines and refine these guidelines going forward. More research is required focusing on the dose-response relationships between physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep with health indicators. Few studies have used valid and reliable measures of sedentary behavior or sleep, or focused on infants or toddlers, or controlled for important confounders like diet, and these deficiencies need to be addressed. Some health indicators had little or no data on the relationships with physical activity, sedentary behavior, or sleep, with evidence particularly lacking for fitness, bone and skeletal health, cardiometabolic health, and risks and harms associated with these behaviors. And limited evidence is available on the combined effects of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep on health in the early years. Future research should focus on examining the combined effect of these behaviors while also developing and assessing innovative ways to analyze these 24-hour data. We also provide surveillance and monitoring recommendations for uh, using the guidelines for surveillance. These are provided in the paper um, that was cited uh, early on in, in this presentation uh, and provided in the reference section at the end here. So details of this are provided in the published paper. And there's a general focus on what is currently measured in these recommendations. So we recommend that if you're doing monitor and surveillance of young children meeting these guidelines, that that, that, that include for infants, for physical activity, the average total tummy time per day being greater than 30 minutes while awake. For toddlers meeting the, guide, the physical activity guidelines, the average total physical activity per day is greater than 180 minutes with some energetic play. And the physical activity for preschoolers that the average total physical activity per day is greater than 180 minutes with greater than or equal to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity or energetic play. The sedentary behavior surveillance recommendations for infants and toddlers less than two would be that a typical day includes no screen time and time restraint uh, is less than one hour, less than or equal to one hour at a time. For toddlers equal to or greater than two years and preschoolers, average sedentary screen time per day should be less than or equal to one hour per day and time restrained, time restrained also less than or equal to one hour at a time. And the sleep surveillance recommendations would be for infants zero to three months, that total sleep duration per 24 hours is 14 to 17 hours, and for infants four to 11 months, that it be 12 to 16 hours. For toddlers, 11 to 14 hours, and preschoolers, 10 to 13 hours. So these combined recommendations uh, should be used to determine whether or not children of this age group are meeting these guidelines. We've also done some analyses already uh, on the surveillance and monitoring of this age group in Canada meeting the guidelines, and you can see that from this Venn diagram. And so let me just explain it. We've got over here 3.3 percent of Canadian three to four-year-olds are meeting none of the guidelines. Those meeting the physical activity guidelines, this circle here, is around 62 percent. 
The sleep duration guidelines is around 84%, and the screen time guidelines around 24%. And you can see the various amounts that meet, so 2.2% meet the physical activity and screen time guidelines, and so on and so forth. And details of this monitoring and surveillance study are also available in a manuscript in the BMC Public Health Special Issue. There was also a paper in the Special Issue, as indicated in the citation here, on toddlers. Now, this is a, a, a study only from an area in Alberta, so a smaller study than the previous one, which did look at uh, a nationally representative sample. But you can see the pattern of prevalence meeting the guidelines in this age group. And so to understand this, if you go to the far right of the uh, diagram, you can see the proportion meeting none of the guidelines is zero, meaning one of the three is nearly 15%, two of the three is nearly three quarters, and all three is only 12.1% which is very much in line with the previous slide where 13% um, of the three to four year olds met all three of the guidelines. And you can see the various breakdowns here as well, the, the proportion that, that met the screen time guideline at least, for example, uh, is 15.4%, meeting the sleep guideline at least is 82, 83%, and nearly 100% meeting the physical activity guideline, which in this age group is 180 minutes of physical activity at any intensity, provided there was at least some energetic play. Again, more details are available in the manuscript uh, in the citation listed on the slide. We need to update and revise these guidelines, of course, and right now we're recommending that that be done on a 10-year cycle, or when any significant new information emerges that would challenge the existing guidelines. Now an interesting side effect of developing these guidelines is the international impact it had. We deliberately had international panelists uh, on our guideline development panel to inform them of what we were doing to take advantage of their expertise but also to help them avoid duplicating work like we've done uh, if they wanted to move in this direction. And indeed New Zealand has done that um, and you'll see on the slide here, their sit less, move more, sleep well, active play guidelines for under fives. They were released in May of this year and um, were based in large, or certainly informed uh, by the work of the Canadian Guideline Development Panel. And the citation is there for you uh, on the slide. We also had Guideline Development Panel uh, representation from Australia. And we were able to actually influence the development of their guidelines, which you can see here, Guidelines for Healthy Growth and Development for Your Child, Australian 24-Hour Movement Guidelines, which were based entirely on the Canadian information. Uh, the citation for it is there on the slide and in the special issue of BMC Public Health. And we coordinated from the beginning uh, the work with Australia such that they released their guidelines the day after we released ours. And as a result of this uptake of an increasing number of countries around the world, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has also demonstrated interest in this. And in their landmark document on the report of the Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity that was released last year, a recommendation in that report, recommendation 4.12, specifically recommends that we provide guidance on appropriate sleep time, sedentary or screen time, and physical activity or active play for the two to five year old age group. So there's a recommend in the recommendation in that report specifically calling for 24 hour guidelines like were released by Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And indeed, the World Health Organization has now initiated a process for developing global 24-hour guidelines for this age group. There are a lot of materials available uh, related to the development of these guidelines if you're interested. As mentioned several times in this presentation, the open access supplemental issue of BMC Public Health is available online for free. That includes the process and outcomes paper, which I'm more or less presenting here in this uh, presentation the four systematic reviews, 
the compositional analysis paper, the stakeholder consultations paper, the prevalence of preschoolers meeting the new guidelines paper, the prevalence of toddlers meeting the new guidelines paper, the Australian adultment paper, and if you want to know what adultment means, please go and read that. And there were also three Australia prevalence papers, one on infants, one on toddlers, and one on preschoolers included in this supplemental issue. There are tear sheets of the guidelines available in English and in French at the CSEP website, or you can order them through CSEP. The guideline development report, which has even more information about the development process, is also available on the CSEP website. This webinar in English and in French is available for your download, for your use at your convenience. There's a glossary of terms. If you're not sure what we mean by some of these terms, uh, please go uh, and have a look. And the digital platform, as I mentioned earlier, on Build Your Best Day for the early years is coming soon and will be available um, by April 1st. So in conclusion, Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for the early years, an integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep, tells us that the whole day matters. Young children need to move, sleep, and sit the right amounts for optimal health. I need to acknowledge all of the people that were involved in the development of these guidelines. On this slide, you will see the list of research experts, stakeholder groups and knowledge users, international collaborators, methodology consultants and project management personnel. Thank you to all of them uh, who were instrumental in the development of the guidelines. And thank you to the partners that provided the funding and support that allowed these guidelines to be developed. Finally, this is a list of the references used within the guideline uh, presentation here. Uh, if you want to actually um, look up these papers, many of them are the papers from the uh, special issue of BMC Public Health as listed on the top there. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.